Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Building 61 Virtual Programming Kickoff. Uh, I'm Adam. I'm Zach. <laughs> I'm muted. I'm Emily. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Robbie. Cool. Uh, we are really excited to be here tonight to talk about some of our uh, upcoming programming and services. Uh, the team just got access to the Makerspace again, and we're prepared to roll out some pretty cool stuff. So uh, to kick this off, I'm going to pass it over to Zach to talk about some of our uh, upcoming virtual guided access, something that I think all of you have been hoping that we've been going to get to, and now we are. Uh, thank you, Adam. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, first of all, like virtually or not, it is really nice to feel like we're reaching back out to the community finally. Um, and a big shout out to all of our other Maker Warriors out there across the country, uh, from Janet to Jeff Branson to the people at Maker Ed, um, uh, Ola, Los Angeles, um, so many people across the country. Um, and uh, uh, it's good, good to rejoin the conversation. Um, the one thing that we have been watching you do is uh, how are you reaching out to your communities? And uh, it would be an understatement to say we've learned a lot by watching um, what other folks are doing around the country. Um, one thing that we've noticed were uh, kits. Uh, there's a lot of you around the country producing kits and we'll get to PPE in a minute. We think that that's like one of the more amazing things that makers have been doing uh, in the past, uh, call it five months now. Um, We've, we've been watching kits and um, the ability of instructors to uh, uh, sort of facilitate the uh, activities around those kits. And we've recognized that they are limited and it's limited further by a student to teacher ratio, so to speak. Um, Hands-on projects are really difficult to facilitate as learners move at different paces, et cetera, et cetera. None of us knew this, I think, until we really moved into the virtual classroom space with hands-on projects. So. Uh, one thing that we looked at as an alternative were basically providing what we do as a service, like an online service, such as a service bureau. 3D printing companies have had this kind of idea around for a long time. Um, we are rolling out next week, and if you go to the calendar at building61.org, you will see, just like old times, for those of you that have been with us before, uh, a new event called Virtual Laser Cutting Guided Access. So Virtual Laser Cutting Guided Access is our foray into the service world. Um, in a nutshell, what that's gonna look like is still, um, fortunately for us, a little personal chit chat with you for just a few minutes um, uh, through a system that uh, gives you a Zoom link uh, where you'll meet us uh, in yet another Zoom meeting. Yes, sorry, um, but- Ours will be fun. It, yeah, it's really fun, right? We, you know, we do it every day just because it's it's that it's that much fun. Ours will um, have lasers involved. <laughs> that's right. No one else's Zoom meetings have lasers involved, we think. Um, so uh, as you zoom in, you'll also be uploading a, a design file. And uh, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, don't worry. We're addressing um, bringing in new people as well or people that uh, don't have the fluency or um, familiarity with design softwares that drive laser cutters, for instance, we've, we've got you covered and we'll get into more detail um, like as you start to participate in that program. We're gonna chit chat with you on Zoom for a little bit. We're gonna look at your files real time. Um, we wanna give a huge shout out and thank you to uh, uh, Christy and Yotam and Ina who helped us prototype this uh, system very successfully. And to my, my buddy, Zachary F, who uh, helped us um, sort of figure out what this would look like in the 3D printing realm. Um, they uploaded their files. They had a quick Zoom meeting with us. Uh, we agreed that we understood together what the goal of the project was. We then produced the goal in the shop ourselves. Uh, we then carefully package it um, and place it in a safe area for you to pick up with all of the instructions that include things like wearing a mask, social distancing and the recommendation that you let your parts sit for a certain minimum amount of time uh, to not uh, uh, bring any uh, cooties into your house. Um, and so again, if you look on the calendar at Building 61, uh, there is a new virtual laser cutting guided access and a lot of information. So those of you that have used the laser cutting system in the past, 
please read all the fine print. Um, this is a service that we intend to offer like because we can and, and for the time being. Our goal, as always, is to bring people back into the space and share our time and space together um, as that becomes a possibility again. Uh, until then, um, as makers are doing all kinds of utilitarian efforts um, nationwide and internationally, um, we're hoping that this new service is something that provides the most use of these uh, uh, of, of this equipment um, at at maybe even an increased level of access, oddly enough, um, back to uh, the Building 61 community and to establish a model for libraries everywhere that um, this, uh, this is possible to be um, a really vital resource uh, for a community that's been cut off from many of its affordable resources. So uh, check it out at the calendar at building61.org. Um, email us at building61 at boulderlibrary.org with general questions and uh, it's it's on it's live it's ready to be scheduled now so um, dig in and I really hope to see um, some of our old friends and maybe even some new friends next week awesome uh, I want to mention that we actually have a, uh, a new link to the calendar as well a new way to take a look at that uh, Emily if you want to share that up on the screen I think that'd be awesome the link for the yes. application. Both. Let's do All both. Right. <laughs> um, so let's see. Here is the link. Um, it is a Heroku app. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that means, but um, I put together a little thing that can show our schedule in a little bit more uh, mobile, especially mobile friendly way. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. So you can see that there is dates across the top and then each date is broken down into the offering. So you can scroll through um, those dates and see uh, different offerings. As you can see, there's a lot of virtual laser guided access here, um, which we're really excited to, um, to get into. Yeah, those uh, lasers, uh, you know, when you turn them on for the first time, it takes a little while for them to warm up. This is probably the longest they've taken to warm up uh, <laughs> since we began running them in 2016. So we're excited to get these things fired up and start making some cool projects. And Adam, I feel like there's a there's an elephant in the laser cutter. Uh, can you mention something about how we're planning on onboarding new patrons? that uh, have not already taken our laser cutting training because that used to happen in person. So in the future, how are we gonna get new people into uh, virtual laser cutting guided access? Right on, so we're taking this opportunity to produce a lot of new video content. And part of that is gonna be doing virtual tool orientations. So in the past, we would run them uh, once a month until very recently we were running them twice a month that was right before we closed. We were like, yes, we're gonna offer this more often than usual and people are gonna get more access than they normally would. Well, we're gonna be doing this virtually. So what is gonna happen is uh, we'll be producing a video that talks about um, all the capabilities of the laser, uh, what types of files you need to produce to be able to get things made on it. Uh, and we'll be there to sort of facilitate the video. So during a tool orientation, you'll be able to join kind of a classroom situation uh, with us. You'll be able to watch the video uh, and We'll be there to answer questions. So any kind of like pressing thing that you might have to ask, we'll be able to say, oh, well, that's a really good one. Uh, we can even add that to the tool orientation later. Or I might say something like, wait until seven minutes and 30 seconds and that answer will be uh, made clear to you. So um, we're really excited to offer that um, to everybody. And that video is gonna be available to everyone offline after they've taken the class. So that's gonna be necessary for some of the, the new folks who are coming in to use the lasers. But everyone who has previously taken the tool orientations, they're, they're free to sign up for this. Awesome. Yeah, so some pretty cool stuff. Uh, we also have um, some other new programming uh, coming down the pike here. So one of the uh, things that we're really excited about is what we're calling a community show and tell. So weekly, we are going to be hosting an event just like this one, same time, seven o'clock, uh, where you, the community, get to come hang out with us and sh 
talk about whatever cool things you're working on. You can show us your workspace, talk about your garden, uh, any anything that you are making. Like we are excited to uh, share your joy, uh, like of that process. Um, today we've kind of prepared some of the stuff that uh, we've been working on since we closed in March. Uh, there's some things that we've been doing for the library. There's some things that we've been doing for fun. Uh, and you know, pretty much everything kind of in between. It feels like it's been 50 years since March has passed. So it really like, does. It really does. About a million, about a million things have happened, and also like nothing has happened. So I, I don't know. But it's a temporal <laughs> state that I think that we're all experiencing presently. Just quit using time. That's the key. You, you know, we've been saying it, and yet we we keep doing it. We keep <laughs> scheduling things with like a calendar and a clock. I don't I don't know why. <laughs> I guess we need some kind of order. There's a workaround. I'm sure of it. <laughs> cool. Um, we're also going to have some outside instructors coming in. We'll have more on that uh, in the future. So there's some pretty cool folks doing neat things in our community that we'll be excited to announce later. Um, so keep an eye on that. It's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, to speaking bring of more utility. Folks in. Yeah, to, to, to just expand on that a, a little bit. Um, our individual outside instructors um, from uh, Adriana to Stephen in the, the Colorado Sewing Workshop to um, our good dear friends whose work is now more critical than ever at uh, the UFixit clinic. Um, you know, we're, we are uh, uh, working on uh, finding the time and space to bring those programs back into this type of forum in a meaningful way. And we hope that that dovetails with the service model that we're talking about where uh, say a, a replacement part for a lamp, Wayne, um, needs to be produced uh, via 3D <laughs> printer or something like that. Um, we're, we're looking forward to uh, those kinds of mashups. So uh, those of you that are out there listening, uh, um, we're, we're, we're here to help you uh, save money and solve problems without just consuming. Um, and uh, looking forward to possibilities there. Cool. Uh, and if anyone has any questions about anything that we're up to or, or any makerspace stuff, ask them in the chat. You know, we're, we're happy to ask them in real time as soon as we see them. Uh, uh, without further ado, I think uh, we're, we're going to jump into the, the Building 61 show and tell portion of this just to give you kind of a preview of how this how this works. Um, essentially, what, what will happen is weekly we are going to have an event posted and you're going to be able to sign up to join us in this uh, channel. So you'll essentially, after signing up, get a link uh, that will take you to essentially a broadcast studio that you'll be in like a backstage area and we can add you into the feed. So this is sort of like a radio show uh, kind of idea, but you'll be able to share your screen, share your camera and talk about what's up. So um, we're gonna dive into that now. Uh, which of us wants to start? You sort of moved your hand, Zach, so that, that feels like you're volunteering. I feel picked on, uh, but I that's good because uh, I mainly want to um, <laughs> talk about uh, personal protective equipment that um, that we really dove into, so uh, I can do that. Should I go? Yeah, you should go. You should talk about personal the protective equipment and all the Great. stuff that we've been doing. Well, I didn't know this was going to happen, so I've only prepared a short 2 minute and 17 second video. <laughs> Uh, that's synopsis, it's a synopsis of, uh, of the things that, uh, that I've been doing, but, uh, Buckle up. I, 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 I want to, I want to acknowledge, uh, ahead of time, um, our, our brilliant, uh, latest addition to the team, Emily, and that, um, I got I'm, I'm, I was literally outside of the Bellagio in Vegas watching the fountain thing when Emily was preparing and and raising uh, awareness and the alarm and creating the plans and disseminating the plans for mask making, which um, I hope uh, I, ho I hope the debate there is being laid to rest slowly but surely. But um, uh, you know, Emily, like huge kudos and shout out for your foresight um, and preparedness and proactiveness and planning and uh, teaching us all. Um, how to how to sew these things, um, which we we now own many of. So uh, as a major piece of our our PPE production, um, you know Emily really helped us uh, uh, spearhead and uh, be in a leader position there. Um, so thanks Emily for that. 
Thank you. Yes. You will. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is for uh, all of us. It, it is for all of us. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about some stuff that is for some of us. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the things that we did for uh, 3D printing and so on and so forth. Uh, the famous raid, the infamous raid on uh, Building 61 was a thing that happened around March 13th or 14th. And that included grabbing uh, certain pieces of really critical what we saw as um, sort of the PPE production equipment uh, supreme. Um, and and we're acknowledging our, our privilege and, and the gratitude towards the Library Foundation and Boulder Public Library that we had access to these things and our leadership for saying, you know, we need you out of the building, but uh, in this case, it's okay. Go grab that stuff. So uh, in my shoe closet, for instance, uh, was set up uh, two 3D printers from the space that anyone that's been there has seen. Um, and uh, my beloved roommate, Vig, and I listened to these 3D printers uh, for months, cranking out some of the things that I'm going to share with you now. So um, nationwide, um, I have to hit the play button here. Uh, nationwide, uh, uh, Joseph Prusa, who is a, a manufacturing company for 3D printers, um, had worked on a design for face shields. Face shields are sort of the secondary covering that you'll see a lot of medical professionals and first responders wearing. Um, there was an immediate shortage and an amazing army of 3D printers out there in the country and in the world that helped uh, fill this uh, shortage in supply by uh, 3D printing this design that you see here. And I've got one uh, here. Uh, they, you can see in the video is sort of demonstrating one thing above all. This is a major, there's a major gap here between manufacturing and um, 3D printing these things. But uh, thanks to a great group called Make for COVID, which is organized through CU Boulder, um, we were able to donate about 60 of these completed masks um, to them. They distributed them to first responders and healthcare systems in the region. Uh, and we donated another 40 or so uh, for a total of about 100 to directly to uh, some healthcare providers that that um, we uh, that reached out to us directly. Um, along with that, uh, Make for COVID, I have to mention, and we've become part of their network today. Uh, posted that they have distributed 81,532 pieces of PPE, and this is all from makers like yourselves. So, um, pretty pretty impressive effort. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen now hopefully is somewhat familiar to you. These are generally referred to as ear savers. This is a modification on a design from a, a very young person who uploaded this to Thingiverse, um, and it was downloaded about 251 times um, and modified. This is our modification here that you see on the screen. Uh, and it pulls elastic off of the back of your ears if you're wearing elastic masks. And then the last thing I've been working on is uh, some online instruction and learning about what um, the, the, the do's and don'ts of good quality online instruction are. And I want to shout out to my nephews and, again, my buddy Zachary F. for uh, helping me prototype those classes. And uh, that's it on the sort of making, making front. Um, been very busy. Uh, I want to add in there that we uh, have produced some kits for CU Science Discovery, uh, which is a summer program that reaches out to um, local youth, um, and I think in particular at-risk youth, to make sure that their summer learning opportunities uh, are rich and uh, fruitful. Um, and so we did some laser cut kits for them that we um, distributed. Uh, you know, free of charge. It's it's a great partnership for us. It's the least we could do. And in a way, it was an excuse to be like, hey, I really need to get into the space to use some laser cutters because I haven't done that for three months and I'm freaking out. <laughs> um, and uh, and another shout out to uh, uh, Jeff Branson, formerly of Spark Fun um, Electronics in the education department, who has, and I don't want to over promise here, um, has been helping us prototype a uh, a, a space camp program. Uh, those of you that aren't familiar, our 2019 space camp program was a high altitude balloon launch program that really focused on what's up? that really focused on um, getting young people 
involved in uh, data collection out in the real world, and then um, the, the processing and um, sort of uh, making use of large sets of data. Obviously, we can't do that in person as much as we'd like to invite all of you to a balloon launch um, right now, but uh, Jeff Branson has been helping us prototype uh, the future of Space Camp, or at least the near future of Space Camp, um, which we think will be uh, more far-reaching um, because it's on a virtual platform. So I mentioned earlier the, the irony of um, us having a broader reach due to um, quarantine um, because it's forced us to sort of reimagine our programs. And that's another one that uh, I'm looking forward to in the near future um, and uh, ask questions about that, um, reach out. Uh, I hope we can make that happen. And I'm going to pass the conch over to Robbie. Robbie. Robbie? Yeah. <laughs> Emily. Emily, Emily go first because what she has done leads into what I have done. Oh, I see. It's a whole like uh, this, that's the third act of the movie or the second. And it, I. I'm just gonna mute my mic now. What, what, what if I just? What if I just go? What if I just go? Like, oh no! Me, right? I, I didn't even. Gonna do it anyway. Didn't see yeah. sitting there, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. I just descended into the void behind me. Thanks for sticking around. You shouldn't have worn that green shirt against your green screen. Yeah. Um. So, we've all kind of been doing a lot of weird stuff. Like, just like we we've, we've been reassigned to all other departments in the library. We've been doing all kinds of extra work uh, from. Emily doing call center things, Zach's writing grants, Robbie's building uh, all kinds of, you know, crazy COVID related protective like furniture essentially. Uh, and for my part, I've spent a ton of time working on the back end uh, of our digital programming. So setting up things like StreamYard, uh, which is what we're using to uh, broadcast this, uh, to working with OBS and trying to get kind of trying to get our video presence online for the library. This is, I think, something that libraries in general, like weren't truly prepared for, like in any way. I think a lot of times uh, libraries are just like, everything will be in person. That's sort of like libraries gig, right? I mean, like that's kind of the reason, you know, like why you go to the library. It's, it's exciting to be there in person and have those kind of serendipitous moments of discovery. It's makerspace especially, same kind of thing. Like we all decided to kind of like ditch our home garages to go hang out in like a one community space together. And here we are essentially back in our home garages trying to get things done. Um, so, you know, this is, this has actually been like the like lion's share of the work for me is trying to make this type of thing happen and actually getting it going at last for us in building 61 and getting the team back together has been pretty huge. Um, the library itself has a pretty cool um, video, uh, video broadcast studio now that we're going to be using for more and more programming. So you're going to be seeing some actually really cool musical story times coming up. We just had a, a test shoot this afternoon. So keep an eye out for that. Like that's actually going to be was, awesome. Was that the Taylor Swift uh, video shoot? Yeah. 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 That's a, I, you know, <laughs> I heard about her the other day. I think she's going to be big. I'm encouraged. <laughs> We're not going to turn this into like a, a tool versus Taylor Swift thing, are we? Like, let's not like, let's not, let's not, let's not right? like drag that up again. There is the clear winner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a. Uh... <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's been a lot of a lot of digital work. But it, you know, anyone who knows me from the space knows that I'm always buried in a, a giant pile of projects that I'm 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 always doing all the time. So you know, my spare time, I'm I'm developing board games or I'm trying to produce assets for uh, the, the band that I'm in. Uh, we actually had to cancel our European tour that was scheduled in April because of all this, which was a huge bummer. Album still came out though, which is awesome. But one of the, one of the fun things that like the more like makery elements of, uh, of the projects that I was working on recently uh, was essentially developing a sort of an add on asset to one of the board games that I worked on called Eschaton. And uh, it's this little round marker, which indicates uh, who's who's t going first on this particular round. So this is a very like dark fantasy Game of Thrones sort of Hellraiser type of world. So everything's a little bit dark, uh, but that's kind of my style anyway, you may have noticed. Um, but wanted to make a metal coin version of this. So over the, the course of several months, took that concept and actually started developing it in 3D. 
So I use a program called ZBrush to do a lot of my sculpting. And ZBrush is something that you very typically see in, uh, you know, like doing like video games or like doing like prop design or character design or actual physical sculpting. It's a little bit different than the type of traditional CAD design that you would see for say, designing like a mechanical part for a car or something like that. And the goal was to produce like an actual coin, like produce a metal coin from this. So I, in ZBrush, hopefully this works if I share it. ZBrush is kind of a funky program. Actually sculpted this whole thing out. So this was all essentially sculpted. Some fun artifacting here uh, within the software. And this actually is just like working with clay. So like in here, I had started with just a very basic cylinder and I've got a stylus tablet. So on here, like you can just go right in and start building up designs on it and smoothing things out and adding texture. So really, really cool process. And um, because I knew this thing was going to go to manufacturing, I tried to make it as solid of a design as possible. I've got a resin printer at home, a little $200 Anycubic Photon, which does these really, really nice resin prints. And I'm going to hide this and kind of show you up close. I'm going to go to solo mode here. Yes kind of change the focus. They actually 3D printed this thing. And you can actually see there was some old resin in the printer. I ran out of gray and started printing in this kind of a matte red color. Let's see if I can change the focus to make that a little bit better. Yes, slightly better. Maybe. Yes. OK, cool. Yeah, you can actually see that. So the quality of the resin is actually really, really nice. Like these printers can accomplish a lot. This was sort of a first draft of the print after that 3D model had happened. Got up to a second version where the details were a little bit more visible. So this is just a process of iteration of saying like what's actually visible and not visible based on like the scale of the thing. That's actually really difficult to tell. And so finally, um, I was working with a manufacturer overseas that I typically work with for board game stuff uh, and worked with them to actually CNC mill the metal coin version of this. So we actually have a limited run of these things that got made. So that is essentially a process of essentially developing a 3D prototype uh, at home uh, all the way to producing the CAD files that this could be shipped to an actual manufacturing factory. This is a brass that's been electroplated with nickel and given kind of a like a rough kind of like dark wash. And it's very satisfying. This is a very heavy coin. I don't know if anyone can hear this, but when you drop it, <laughs> <laughs> that is that is that is just glorious. That's really cool. Adam, I have I have a, a comment and then a question. The the comment is like I would have guessed that um, there's a lot of processes that go from 3D printing to lost lost wax casting, um, such as uh, dental mm -hmm. implants and uh, um, even even jewelry. Uh, that's been going on for a while. Um, I'm I'm a little surprised to hear that that's CNC milled. Uh, and so my my question is is there a um, is there a, a, do you have a choice about having that uh, cast in a, in like a casting process? And then I have and then mm -hmm. I have a follow up question. Somewhat. It kind of depends on who your manufacturer is. It, sometimes it's very difficult to tell kind of like what the actual process is that's being advertised when you are working with a manufacturer overseas. Mm. Um, you can you can kind of gauge that process well enough. The, actually, the really tricky part for me, I assume that I could just provide them an STL, like no problem, like be like, all right, here's like a basic 3D print file and be like, mm -hmm. hand it off, you know, <laughs> just like doing a 3D print, right? No, no yeah. problem. I It's it's airtight, you know, like this this 3D model is perfect, I've double, triple checked it. And they're like, yeah, no, this has got to go into like a V-Carve-like program. And wow. a lot of the program, a lot of it has to be re-sculpted at that point. So like V-Carve is what we use for the um, for the CNC machine in the mm. shop, the shop bot. So like if you were to do three-dimensional sculpting, you actually have to have a metal mill. So that can get in little tiny details and like carve all those little parts out yeah. and actually make that, that actually stick. And, some of that little texture is really remarkable. I don't know if I can get, kind of get that in focus. But yeah, it's quite detailed. There's, yeah, there's a lot of little stuff in there that that has to happen. So <laughs> that was that was actually a total surprise to me. But being able to like continuously work on that model just with the software that I had, you know, on hand, 
was great. Now, ZBrush is a paid piece of software. Like, that's something that I've got a license for just because I do a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, but you can actually achieve really, really similar results with a free piece of software called Sculptress. It's made by the mm -hmm. same folks. It's kind of the introductory version of it. So there's, like, some features that, like, you kind of want to have that are missing. But you can honestly accomplish, like, a ton with it. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, the reason I asked about the difference between, like, CNC milling and uh, casting is because, like, I mean, relatively speaking, casting like injection molding is something that would happen like pretty quickly in a process like mm -hmm. that. And I'm wondering, you know, how many are you are you actually anticipating uh, making? Because, uh, you know, my Bitcoin is not great. It's not doing great right now. And, uh, and I'm investing in money markets and I'm wondering if uh, what your valuation <laughs> is right now. So like in terms of like, what is the value of this coin? Like, yes. uh, you know, I mean, like, and can I have some of that value is really the question I'm getting at. <laughs> just just, just like the, the warm feeling of supporting a friend, I'm afraid. But uh, mm. that's, there's the value there. I know, yeah. I know, it's, it's, it's not, not as, quite as much. But uh, yeah, like the way, the way that it's done is like they will, act, <laughs> as I understand it, is that the, the actual shop that produces these has about 20 mills that are running at once. So they're actually like have like a jig that they'll flip it like, you know like over to do the opposite side. Again, you'd probably be hard to see what's happening there, but there is a tiny line along the edge that they have mostly sanded down. And the, it's it's brass to begin with, and the electroplating process is they, they will essentially dip this in a solution, mm. uh, creating an electric charge that will draw that nickel onto it, uh, giving this, it this finish. This is plated 3D print. This is not carved metal, or is it, is it, it carved it, metal? It's carved metal. It's carved brass. OK. Like. You said 20 so mil? It, it, 20 mils? Thick? This thing? Like, I don't yeah. know the actual, like, the plating, like, you know, thickness. That's, I don't know that. <laughs> Emily sees the setup here. I'm like, I'll take 20 mil. That sounds good. All right. <laughs> I'm going to mute my mic. Tro trolling me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and, and, you know, like, it's fun process. Like, it's, it's really, it's really cool, pr like, going through this type of thing and if this is something that anyone is interested in like that's this is a process that i'm pretty familiar with so like if you want to go like from like a prototype thing to a fully manufactured you know object like a product like that's something that you can you can utilize our resource to figure out like that's that's kind of the fun of building 61 so i really like to kind of practice what we preach there like and, and just figure that kind of stuff out yeah so who wants to who wants to Talk about more stuff. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I have um, been working a lot, doing all kinds of different things, and still trying to do everything possible on the side. Um, so it was really hard to decide what to talk about. Um, However, there is something that I did accomplish uh, that influences my every day. Um, so I decided I'd at least first talk about that. Um, I don't know if um, any or all, I mean, I know some of you did uh, go to our Maker Made show. Um, I made a, a series of t-shirts um, that were very fancy, but I still, um, could wear them every day and feel like if I, you know, burned a hole in it from soldering, it would be not that big of a deal. Um, so they were amazing. And I was like, this is what I'm wearing for the rest of my life every day forever. Um, and then summer came and I was like, I don't want sleeves um, at all anymore. <laughs> um, and so I really wanted to make a new shirt that I was going to wear every day for the rest of my life um, that was a little more cool and a little more, uh, summer friendly. Um, and so that's what I'm going to show you. Um, so I'll show you the one that I have on. I seriously wear this every day. Um, it has the same front and back because I'm pretty creative slash lazy. I'm not really sure how you can <laughs> tell the difference sometimes. Um, but it's, it's, it's one pattern piece. Um, same in the front and back. So here it is folded. So you'd cut this on the fold. And you can see the arm arm size here. And it's just this one piece. 
And then a bunch of bias tape, which we probably all know if you've made any masks, you've probably made thousands of yards of bias tape. Um, and so it's finished just uh, right here with bias tape. And then this is folded under. So it's, um, it's a pretty simple project um, in terms of number of pieces. And um, the construction is really fun um, because like, it's not like you're going to like accidentally sew something wrong. Everything is just like kind of like the same. But I'll show you um, a couple of the finished shirts that I have. Thank you. Um, I have eight of them because I usually like when I make things, I like go to town. Um, so I think this one's my favorite. I love this print. Um, so there's that one. I have a lot of gray slash blacks. I mean, it's kind of like a required wardrobe choice. It's kind of our trademark. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, but they're all made a, out of like a really summer friendly um, fabric material. They're all like rayon, tencel, viscose, which are similar fabric uh, families. It's basically all kind of the same. Um, what you do to make rayon or viscose uh, or tencel is essentially you take a bunch of cellulose, which is plant fiber, which could be left over from all kinds of milling techniques. In fact, they do one from cotton where they take all the other fibers and all the plant material from the cotton industry that is not utilized in uh, creating cotton fabric and they chemically break it down. So just like um, you dissolve salt into water, you dissolve the cellulose into a different um, medium to where it's no longer um, a solid, it's all a liquid. And then they repolymerize this into um, kind of like a silk-like strand. Um, and so it's, it's considered a, like a non-synthetic fiber because it does come from plant materials. Um, but it's, it's kind of like in between like a, uh, a natural fiber and a synthetic fiber. And they're really, it's really a nice uh, fabric, usually has a lot of drape, really wonderful in really hot uh, climates. Um, and a lot of it can be very, um, it, it takes a lot of waste out of the landfill. Um, you can reuse a lot of those solutions. Um, there are some that are a little bit more environmentally conscious than others, uh, but it's a really interesting um, uh, fabric uh, making technique. Um, so that's what I've been mostly working on. It's like those lovely shirts that I'm wearing every day. Um, Emily, can I interject? There's a there's an interesting yeah. question here, and this is this is uh, interesting for the times. Uh, uh, where where do you get your fabric for most of these things? And I've gone out on a limb, and uh, and and sort of uh, seeded an answer there. And and uh, one of them I think is probably the right answer. The other answer is Mongolia. I didn't get any um, summer fabric from Mongolia, if you can imagine that. I did get, I'm gazing at it right now, this lovely cashmere, super lightweight piece um, that is just like a treasure to cuddle. But no summer fabrics, no summer fabrics from Mongolia. Um, they didn't have a really good selection. How um, are the summers there? Uh, they're pretty chilly. <laughs> Breezy. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty chilly. I mean, I mean, it depends on where, yeah, it's pretty chilly. I mean, it's kind of like if you took, I don't know, if you took like Montana and like raised it to like mountain level in Denver or something or, or like not Denver, but like the, in the, I don't even remember what the, um, the altitude is, but it's just like, it's like being at altitude, but there's like giant plains. Um, it's so beautiful. It's so Among beautiful. our 17 current watchers right now, I, I apologize if any of the lowland Montanans are <laughs> into The lowlands. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so beautiful. And it really reminds you of some of the country that, that, um, that you can see uh, close to where we are. So it's really interesting. Um, you know, the other side of the world can be so familiar. Um, but yeah, um, I went to Mongolia like a year ago um, for my husband's birthday and it was really fun. We nice. were fly fishing. 
so cool. He seems to be into that. He's a little into it. <clears throat> yeah. That was actually seven years ago. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's also yeah, true. Uh, on the on the current no, time scale, that's true. 2020 yeah, is know. dog years. <laughs> is yeah, infinite. <laughs> um. So other things that I've been either occupying my time or planning on occupying my time. Um, I've been making videos. If you haven't seen those, I've made a video on mask making. Mm -hmm. um, and I made one on rendered butter, which in fact, we have more butter that's ready to render right now because we're almost out of uh, the last amount that we made was like seven pounds. We gave some, one oh. away, some away, but we, um, we didn't give all of it away and we're ready to make more. Uh, I also made uh, some sauerkraut, a sauerkraut video and a soldering video. Um, and I just made a video on how to preserve a wild food. Um, so I'll be working on editing that pretty soon. And I was thinking about um, when I went to visit my parents, they had these uh, this, this catalpa with some of the longest catalpa pods I'd ever seen. Um, the outside parts. And I and, challenged and, myself a long time ago to try, go ahead, Zach. Uh, catalpa is that giant green bean tree uh, where <laughs> the green beans never, that I never seem to be able to digest them no matter how long I boil them. It, <laughs> it is a medicine, um, which I, ha I don't have uh, a lot of familiarity with, but I believe it has um, some, uh, Heart conditions are uh, associated, or you can uh, address heart conditions with it, but I would definitely do your research. I have not myself worked with it before, so of course I would not recommend anything myself before um, you know, getting to know the, the plant first. Um, but the catalpa, the um, outside of that bean, um, the inside comes off and it's kind of like a vanilla bean, and then the outside um, is like a, the structural part. Um, this is really long for a catalpa pod outside. And so I challenged myself a long time ago to make uh, some baskets out of some really short ones. I was like, let's just see if I can do it. Um, and when I saw the long ones, I was like, oh my God, this looks so much easier. <laughs> Easy uh, mode. Yeah. So here's my first one. And I hadn't done basket making in years. So it's a little like wobbly. Um, so you can see it kind of like shifting around there. And then this is the second one, which is a little, has a little more structural integrity. Um, but yeah, I've been using this to go out and collect vegetables and eggs. And so I'm actually using it. Um, so I was thinking about maybe making a little video on how to make little baskets. Um, not the, it's not the easiest with catalpa pods, but it's, it's really fun and they're around. It's a really great uh, source of material that um, seems pretty plentiful in this area, so. Nice. Is it, uh, is like, I actually am not super familiar with like making baskets. Is, is it a form of like circular weaving then? Like, is that like what, how that works? I mean, having used like the looms in the space like a billion times, like it never kind of occurred to me that like baskets were made in a similar way. Totally. <laughs> but seeing it, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I know yes. this technology, I think. Yes. And like the, the bottoms are a little bit hard because they, um, they're flat instead of like being sort of more round. So it's a little bit weird, but basically you take, um, you take long pieces. I can show you with some of these. Well, first you take these, um, these outside parts, you soak them for a long time. I did mine overnight, but it was kind of better when it was uh, warm. So like I waited for the sun to come out and for them to get warm because then it's like warm water that you're soaking your hands in. But if it's a super hot day, maybe cool water is what you want. Um, anywho. Nice. Um, Emily, so uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have a question, but it, it can wait till the very end. Okay. So you just take however many you kind of want to start with. So if it's three, uh, two or three or however many, and then you want to add like one extra section. So maybe you'll take a shorter one and just kind of like align it with one of your spokes and you'll go around, up and down, up and down, up and down. And if there's an odd number, you'll just naturally go over the unders and under the overs. Cool. 
if that cool. makes sense. Yeah, no, I got it. I, like yeah. this, I, I'm excited for the video for this. Like, I know that mm -hmm. there's probably some folks out there who haven't weaved, wo wove, weaven, woven before that, that that was probably a little bit alien to them. But yes. it's gonna be cool. You're gonna love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. And like, it, I mean, it can be like really frustrating. You're like, oh, I'm terrible at everything. Uh, just like ever learning anything new. You're like, oh, this is reflective of my entire life. And then you're like, yes. oh, actually, this is fun. Yes, em yeah. Emily, we're, we're constantly watching you struggle with things. That is, that is your defining characteristic, is your your seeming lack of inability to accomplish a new skill or task. That's Apparently I enjoy it. That's I precisely who you are. I know. <laughs> uh, Watch out for that one. Speaking of that, Emily, before we before we digress too much, uh, you also spearheaded another thing with our video production in terms of... Uh, uh, mask making, um, making sauerkraut, um, making a, a, a solderable simple circuit. Um, I think you, I think you know what I'm picking up on, and I think an awesome time to like help the community hear about that effort and uh, how we're trying to reach uh, a broader audience. So, um, if you, if you follow me, great. If you don't, I'll slack you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about multilingual videos and the fact that uh, oh, yeah. you, you really came up with an interesting way for us to uh, solve a lot of problems with that. You want to say something about that? Sure, sure. So um, something that we've been uh, working on is um, translating all of these videos in Spanish. And so um, I'm putting them all together. So if there's audio issues or if there's syncing issues, like blame this one right here. Um, because also on this break, I learned how to edit video and um, put some dubbing on it and all of that things. But we do have um, the ghee video, the mask video, the sauerkraut video, and the soldering video. I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Um, but we have them all translated into Spanish as well. So, yeah, Yay. reaching a new audience there. Yeah, and well done. You really helped us uh, uh, commit to that and um, and make it as high quality and fun as uh, uh, as as everything else that we've done. We're working with some good friends on that. So, yeah, thank you for that. Yes, yes. Um, shall we hand it over to Robbie? Hello. Um, <laughs> Hi. So <laughs> hi. Hey, hey, big fella. Where's your black shirt? What's uh, there's some comments on the uh, the plaid. I didn't want to. He's, he's wearing anyway. the, he's, he's wearing his uniform. All right. Like this is this is Robbie style. We're all wearing our uniforms here. It is. You look great. <laughs> Thanks. So when uh, when we all got kicked out of the building, I got home. And I missed the sound of machines. <laughs> and I knew that there was a shortage of masks. Um, and since I have a long history of sewing, <laughs> which means I, I sat in on one of Stephen Frost's wonderful sewing rebellions probably a few years ago, which was great. And I didn't do any sewing after that until seeing Emily's video on how to make masks. Um, so I decided at that point that I wanted to get up to speed and make as many masks as I, as I could. Um, so that's what I did. I have some photos of the process. All right, let's get that shared up here. Whoop. There we are. So there mm. is me Stylish. modeling a mask that actually Zach designed the fabric um I was, it's because uh, i had a great uh, water <laughs> i had a great watercolor instructor uh, in emily <laughs> that's lovely i'm glad to see that uh, all over your face <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I set up a little assembly line and uh going by emily's video i uh i made a few of them first and then I ended up doing them in like batches of 10 just for efficiency's sake. Um, so that was that was pretty fun. I got to become at least a little bit fluent with sewing. And uh, 
so I hope to take on some other sewing projects in the future. I really enjoyed that, and it was it was nice to be able to uh, make hundreds of masks that are hopefully. You're being helpful. falsely you're being falsely modest, Robbie. How many how, what, how many masks <laughs> did you crank out? I I don't have a number. It's it's don't in, lie. It's I really, live. I really don't. <laughs> People I, can tell. I I had stopped keeping track after a couple hundred. I, I okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna just get like, give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, more than two hundred. More than two hundred. Yeah, he, he's being falsely modest, folks. He definitely cranked out more than two hundred. It was more than two hundred, but I don't know where. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. two hundred. The the the, the, the sewing machine was more or less an extension of Robbie. You became a cyborg during this process. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else did you do, Robbie? Um, so once I had access to the shop again, um, there was a need for um, sneeze guards for when the public can start to enter parts of the building, which will gradually happen. Um, so there are some examples of um, different molding shapes um, and plexiglass goes into the little slots there and they assemble in different fashions like that. Um, and the desktops that I was working with are kind of different shapes with different shape curves. And I'm dealing with straight lines, so I had to come up with different angles for different desks. So some of them were 45, some of them were 22 and a half, some of them were 12 and a quarter or whatever. Uh, How many centimeters is that angle? You'll have to talk to Adam about centimeters. Mm. Mm. I do not I know what they are. I don't, th I, don't, I don't think there's such a thing as metric angles. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I think angles mm. are metric. I smell I opportunity. Know. So here there's are the like ones. There's like trees and radians, but. Uh, all right. Okay. Someone in the chat is going to be like, Adam, the metric guy if, is totally wrong. I, I want, I'd like everyone to, uh, I want, I want everyone to uh, express their uh, uh, project goals in Euler angles, please. I know Jan knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, when, when they asked me to do this, um, many of the sneeze guards that I had seen out in the world were pretty sterile looking and pretty not very They're warm. Crappy. <laughs> not very <laughs> warm. So I was hoping to, <laughs> to do something that was a little bit more warm. So I was kind of going for something like a bus station window or train sta old train station window. Um, and it seems like they are serving their purpose and Look decent, mm. which is what I was mm. going for. I like for. that throwback. Uh, Jan, Jan from Patron Services says, uh, "Patron Services, thanks you, Robbie. They're they're happy and impressed. And uh, to date, there, she says there are only. She says there's only three boogers on them, and that's a testament to your anti booger spray that you put is on. Is that the thing that was said? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Jan said that. Well, it saved." It saved at least three people from boogers then, so that's <laughs> that's good. Um, so th another thing I was tasked with, um, since things like this are in short supply and also have a specific look to them, um, I was asked to build some um, Purell dispenser mm. stands. Yeah. Um, so you can see on the far end was the one that uh, they had that I kind of modeled the shape on. But again, I just kind of wanted to go with something a little bit, a little bit warmer, and a little bit, a uh, little bit cooler. And, and uh, if, if you had, to, if you had to guess, uh, because because I got an estimate on uh, the price of those things retail. If you had to guess, uh, your hours included, how much uh, would one of these be? How how much would it cost to buy one of these from you? I'd have to figure it out because I was working on these. I made all of them at once, and I was making sneeze guard parts at the same time. So I'd, mm -hmm. I'd probably have to make another one tracking my time to really give an accurate answer to that. Would it be less than $500? Because my understanding was that from uh, like Granger Industrial Supply or another equivalent industrial supply, uh, that, that those things are being sold for $500 a piece, and that seems a little gougy. 
Wow. Or like a stand that holds like oh. a... It's a wood carving, a uh, gougie. It's a pun there for you wood, wood people. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to turn off my monitor. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, especially making them in groups would be way less than $500 each. Mm. Nice. Um, Robbie, you probably, I don't know if you have anything more, but uh, like we're approaching like time limit. Not getting a lot of questions, but uh, if, if people have questions now, um, we're approaching the end of the hour and uh, ask questions in the chat um, about services, um, reopening, anything that, uh, that you're curious about. And we'll do our best to answer while Robbie's uh, finishing up. I was about finished up. Um, I'll probably be doing more of these things in the near future um, and hopefully getting in the shops more and some future stuff happening in there. Those uh, those uh, profiles on the uh, on the on the windows are really amazing. Like that's that's something that always like just like I am so impressed by. Like whenever I walk into the shop and I I see like these things come out and I'm like, what is this going to be the corner of and how is it mm -hmm. produced? Like so cool. <laughs> I mean, like you just assume, yeah, there's like a CNC machine or like some kind of robot that like turns these things out at specific angles, but no, no it's not the case. If you unshare me, I can hold a, a profile up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Um, I'm gonna yeah, it, Robbie. That's so cool. Yeah, that's beautiful. And then similar I mean, similar things went on with the the used bookstore that will be open someday. <laughs> yeah, it's good that you built a thing that no one could visit. It's uh, it's gonna be awesome when people get in there. It looks so cool. Like it I'm is way awesome. excited about that. Uh, I, uh, Robbie, how many how many fingers do you have remaining after all of that production? Look at that! Look at that, folks! And that's what I teach, also. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So, offering wood shop classes using table saws to do complex joinery uh, also involves. Uh, 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 zero injuries and well done there. Um, looking forward to everything that you're doing in the shop coming up too. Yeah, uh, well. we've got a question uh, for really for the whole group from um, Sarah and Stefan. Um, any chance uh, we'll be able to send in 3D prints, laser cuts, or CNC jobs in the near future? Um, thoughts. I'm going, to I'm going to be coy and pretend I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, so we're starting out with laser cutting just because that has been, like, the overwhelming demand of what's been hitting us. And, you know, we're, we're trying to be flexible with the stuff, you know? Like, we, we, we want to experience, like, see how this goes initially, like, in the first, like, week or so. And then we're going to start adding in some of these other services um, just to get that kind of stuff rolling. But, uh, yeah, we, we, we anticipate a lot of sort of, like, our are uh, like machine fabrication type stuff, things that we can set up a machine to do. That's what we'll be able to offer as a service versus something like, let's say you had like a, a sewing project, we might not necessarily be able to help you with that because that's a little bit more hands-on involved. Um, we are talking about tool checkout uh, as a thing that we might be able to potentially do, but that's like TBA forthcoming kind of thing. We're still trying to figure out how we can do that safely and efficiently. Yeah, thanks for your patience and your feedback on that, everybody, um, as we're trying to negotiate a brave new world. Um, the the same people uh, have a question about uh, what, what could we use for volunteer help right now? Um, I, I, I can say right now uh, we're in such um, new territory that we're still exploring like where that space is. Um, we've had, uh, you know, kind of specialist people reach out in terms of like, can they help with a certain area? Uh, like the wood shop, for instance, uh, our good friend, uh, Nicoletta, who also thinks the Purell stand should include a weight scale uh, to encourage, <laughs> to encourage one to- Two birds, avoid, two birds and one stone. The Rona 19, as it were. Um, to uh, avoid the Rona 19, uh, and uh, um, a as as we identify roles in this new system, and as we are operating at uh, sort of a somewhat reduced capacity in terms of our hours, 
um, we're constantly looking for ways that uh, our our friends and like our beloved community people can get involved and help us make uh, the patron service um, the quality that we've we've always expected from ourselves. I, I, um, I personally would love to have volunteers show up on the show and tell and, and share what they've been working on, any kind of projects like, you know, we've been apart too long. We gotta get, we gotta get this maker business rolling again. I cannot wait to see everybody and what they've been up to. Yes. <laughs> So Adam, as we're wrapping up the hour, do you want to, you know, do an overview of the future shows on these Tuesday nights and uh, what people can look forward to? What's the process of getting involved? Mm -hmm. So this is this is a, a review slash overview. We talked about this a little bit earlier in the video, but in case you're just tuning in now, uh, we are going to be doing community maker show and tells every Tuesday at seven o'clock. Um, you will be able to sign up to join us live. Um, and present your work and projects or your workspace or anything that you've been making um, with us. Uh, and to do that, you'll be signing up from the calendar. So we don't have those events posted quite yet, but uh, we'll be making an announcement on social media here real soon, as soon as that's up. When you sign up for that event, uh, you will be given a link to StreamYard, which is our broadcasting platform. Uh, and when you show up at the time of the event, you'll be taken to kind of like, there's like a backstage area where you haven't been quite added to the stream yet. Uh, and when it's your turn, we'll let you know and bring you on online. And you'll get um, probably like four to like seven minutes to talk about what your project is, just depending on the number of people that signed up. If it's a low turnout, you'll be able to hang out and talk longer. Um, if there's a ton of people signed up, uh, we're going to try to get through as many folks as we can. And if we can't, we'll try to push people to the next week. Sounds cool. Uh, so, yeah, all of you people out there that have no doubt been working on some things and all of you that like we can help uh, cross promote your, um, you know, maker centered efforts. Um, there's some space in this forum uh, to share out with the community and reach a little bit of an audience that we hope to grow week by week. So uh, that said, uh, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, the, the email is just building 61 at boulderlibrary.org. Um, if uh, you see some potential to make good use of this forum. Um, and, and those of you that we've worked with in the past, um, please let us know like when, not if, we can uh, get you on here and share out what you've been doing with uh, the community as well. Any, uh, <laughs> we're getting some very nice, uh, ah, we miss you. We, we miss you all as well. Like I, I'd, Seriously, big time. I I don't think words can express what it feels like to have a physical community space um, sort of swept out from underneath your feet. Um, but, uh, you know, rest assured, uh, we're doing everything that we can to return these services uh, in the safest way possible. And, um, and if, if you will all join us in uh, observing some uh, pretty reasonable health guidelines, I think our access and uh, your access to the space is going to continue to increase. And uh, that's, that's what we want above all. Yeah. So thank you everybody uh, for tuning in, uh, hanging out with us online. Uh, more to come. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful to be able to reconnect with everyone. I, I can't express that enough. Like this is awesome that we're able to do this and we can get stuff rolling again. Mm -hmm. Bravo. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for showing up, everybody, and posting questions, comments. Uh, and thanks to you, team. Great, uh, great first experience. I've I've always wanted to feel uh, this celebrity with this particular <laughs> <laughs> with this particular group of people. Um, there's, there's no one else I'd rather be associated with uh, uh, online and the face the Facebook. And the the Snapchats or whatever uh, you kids are doing these we're days. We're on YouTube right now, but <laughs> that's great. Thanks, thanks YouTube for making <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> cool. All right, everybody. Uh, see you next time. See you, gang. Take care.